And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their words do follow them. Carrie Trotter, 44, of Raymore, Missouri, passed away Friday, July 24, 1998, at her home. Mrs. Trotter was born June 29, 1957, in Little Rock, Arkansas. She was a homemaker and a member of the Red Ridge Church of Christ. Carrie and her husband, Mark, were married 23 years and had nine children. Carrie loved the outdoors and God's creations. She made the two acres that she lived on as much a park as she could so her children could also enjoy God's creations. Carrie's heart was to find God's will and to respond in obedience. The obedience led her to start homeschooling nine years ago with children in first and third grades and a three-month-old baby at home. Eleven years ago, God used the death of Carrie's 19-day-old baby, Laura Beth, to show her his sovereign will to love. New life was brought to the Trotter home with the birth of six more children. Today, this home is filled with life and laughter because of the blessings of these children. Carrie was preceded in death by her daughter, Laura Beth Trotter, and her father, Richard McEwen. She is survived by her husband, Dr. Mark R. Trotter, of home, eight children, including two sons, Jonathan and Andrew, six daughters, Catherine, Corey, Anna, Sarah, Jamie, and Audrey, all at home. Her mother, Lois McEwen, Little Rock, Arkansas, three brothers, Richard McEwen of Washington, John McEwen of Little Rock, and Kirk McEwen of Kansas City. Shall we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're here to celebrate the life of someone that was such a blessing to so many people. Carrie, whose heart was completely devoted to you and did all in her power to follow your will. We thank you for her life and we thank you for the legacy that she leaves, for her wonderful children, for her husband, for all the friends that she influenced in such a positive way. And we know, dear Lord, that her positive influence will continue and she'll continue to be very much a part of us. But we celebrate the fact that as a Christian, she died in a saved relationship and that she's gone home to receive her reward through your mercy and your grace. And we celebrate that, dear Lord, and we know that whatever suffering and pain that she may have had, that that's at an end and that she's in a world where there is no pain and there is no suffering. But dear Lord, we also recognize at this time that those that have been left behind or her family and her friends have a great void. We ask, dear Lord, that they might feel your comfort and your encouragement and your strength. We know, dear Lord, that you're touched with their loss. We know that you care deeply. We ask at this time that, that you indeed might help them to feel your presence and your comfort. Help all of us to feel that as we also deal with this loss. Help us all, dear Lord, too, to do whatever we can in the days to come to, to help this wonderful family as they continue on to serve you. Be with those who are going to be sharing some thoughts in this service that they'll have the courage and the presence of mind to, to share what's really on their heart. We offer this prayer in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
and Carrie Trotter for a long time. We were students together at Harding. I sat by them in chapel. I had some of the same friends that they had. 
I saw them on campus, but I really didn't know Mark and Carrie. When I graduated from Harding, I was asked to work for a place called Camp Dakota. I had no idea what a Camp Dakota was. I knew that Carrie McCune had grown up out there. I knew Mark and Carrie had been married there. And I knew that it was out in the sticks of Arkansas somewhere. So I at least agreed to go and see what this place was. And as I drove on to this very special place, I fell in love. And when the very first group of kids came and they opened the gates and all these kids with their pillows in hand and the spark in their eye came running into camp, I understood that special love that Carrie had for camp. In a very short period of time, Carrie and Mark came to join us on our team at camp. And I can still remember sitting on this bridge out in the middle of the creek and Carrie walking over and sitting down beside me. And we started talking about families. And she started telling me how important families were. And she was telling me about her dreams and her goals and her aspirations for her family. And I remember sitting on a red bench in the middle of camp. And Carrie would come over and we'd sit and talk about our faith. And she'd tell me about a book she had read or a tape she had heard or a sermon that meant a whole lot to her. And she'd challenge me to grow and push me to try new things. And I remember walking through the camp, and Carrie would follow me, and we'd talk, and she'd say, I want to tell you about a great experience or remembrance I have of Camp Dakota. And I want to tell you about a tradition you've just got to keep, or here's some things you've got to change, and I want you to fix these things. She was very opinionated and wasn't afraid to tell us those things. And she was so gracious to let Mark and I sit up late at night talking to cabins of boys while she took care of babies. It wasn't long before Mark and Carrie's lives got so busy, their career was going and their family was growing, and they couldn't spend every summer at camp. But they continued to be a very special part of our team. They'd recruit kids from all over to send to camp. But when Carrie got ready to send kids to camp, she'd always call me first, and she'd say, now I want to tell you about this kid. And here's the counselor they've got to have, and here's the experience they've got to be a part of. She wasn't ever happy just to send them. But her greatest compliment to me was when she brought me Jonathan and then Catherine, and then Corey to leave at camp for two weeks because I knew how much she loved her family and how hard it was for her to leave them down there for two weeks without her. And it was so interesting when she'd come to pick them up. Other parents would come and get their kids and grab them and take off, but not Carrie. She'd let her kids just mix and mingle and say goodbye, and she would take a hike up to the top. It's a beautiful bluff up there, and she'd sit up there all by herself, and she'd remember, and she'd pray for the camp, and she'd pray for her family. And when she had come down, she had this great smile on her face. She was tired from the climb, but there was a special glow because she had been back to that same mountaintop that had meant so much to her. And as I started camp this last week, and I looked out, or two weeks ago, and I looked out and there were seven trotters, I think, and all their friends, I thought, what a great tribute to Carrie. This year at camp, our theme has been A View from the Top. And we've been sharing with these young people some very special messages. We talked about how neat it was for Noah to stand on top of Mount Ararat, brand new fresh earth, standing there staring out over it with God right on his shoulder and a beautiful rainbow out there. What a great view. What a great mountaintop experience. But we talked about how in order to get to there, he had to go through some valleys, how difficult it was to build that boat and to listen to his friends he wasn't able to convince, and how hard it was to walk away from those friends, but by holding on to God's hand, he was able to do that. And that mountaintop experience was worth the valley he had to go through. And we talked about a beautiful place called Mount Moriah, and a young man named Isaac standing there holding his father's hand, watching a sacrifice of a ram being burned, and God standing there saying, you're so faithful, thank you. But we talked about how he had to go through a valley to get there as well. How difficult it was to stand there with that knife posed above his son he had been waiting a hundred years for. But the view was worth the valley. And we talk about Mount Sinai, and we go on to Mount of Olives, and we talk about, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus standing there getting ready to go back to heaven. What a wonderful view. But what a valley he had to go through to get there as people made fun of him and spat at him, and he had to die. But the view at the end was worth it. But I still didn't understand all the things that were going on with my friend, with Carrie and Mark, until a young man came to be an assistant counselor at camp this last session. And he stood before all the, camper, all the campers and all the staff, and he shared some things that I want to share a couple of things with you from. He 
told us about a thing called the Hubble telescope, and he said that it shows you all the expanses of the heaven. But in order to see all that, you had to look down into the eyepiece. You had to look down to see up. And this young Christian said, the Christian life is just the opposite. In order to understand what's going on down here, you have to look up and look through the eyepiece that's God. And this young pilot went ahead to tell us that when you're on the earth, the view's kind of cluttered. But as you got up to 1,500 feet, you could see a whole lot more of how things fit together. And as you got even higher, you could see even more how things were fitting together. And he challenged the young people at camp and the older people as well to let us look through God's eyes because things made a whole lot more sense through his eyes than we would ever make. And I thought, wow. I could see Carrie McHugh and Trotter standing on the edge of heaven, holding on to God's hand and looking down. And I could see her saying, what a wonderful view. My son is helping take the experiences he's been through to share with others. And she knows her other son and her daughters will do the same thing. And she looked and saw all these friends that were reaching out and holding on their hands and hugging them tight. And I can hear her say, keep climbing through that valley. The view is worth it. Music, singing. Throughout the centuries, this is what helped bring Christians together as a family. And like many of you, Carrie loved to sing. And most of all, she loved to sing with her family. This morning, as we sing together, let's praise God for his goodness and his mercy. Let's also remember Carrie and thank God for his sharing Carrie with us, sharing the Trotter family with us. We're going to be singing the Lord's My Shepherd this morning. I think you have a handout. The Lord's My Shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to
a book of remembrance, a personal Ebenezer to say, Hitherto the Lord has helped us. August 9th, 1986. I've been thinking about the different rates that we come into bloom, reach our potential, whatever. If the U.S. government says our lifespan is 70 years, then I, quote, probably will have 70 years to reach my potential. And yet, isn't the early bird always the one who everyone applauds? With children, it's the early walkers, early talkers, etc. But with adults, it's the early financial success, the early doctor, lawyer, etc. Is this how God counts? Is this how God views our achievement? Is this even achievement in God's sight? I hope not, since at age 32, I haven't achieved much by the world's standards. No great job, no great income, no great status. Just a wonderful husband, two beautiful kids, and a nice home. And I'm so influenced still by the world's value system. God help me. Different flowers bloom at different times of the year. The tulips are beautiful in the spring, June brings roses. August, the wildflowers, and autumn brings mums. Is one more beautiful than the other because it blooms earlier? I want to see my life from God's perspective, not just from the short-term point of view. I don't know if this is possible. That's the first entry in this journal of my mom's. I know my mom's not here right now. So we talked a whole lot. I just go back uh, into her, into the room, and just be there. And we talk, or I just, just sit there. And uh, in a book I just read talked about uh, after a, after a certain guy in the story had died, he pulled a Huckleberry Finn and watched his own funeral from heaven. And. Uh, in this, mom asked if uh, she's a success or not. And in front of all of you guys here, and in front of mom, I want to say, as her first child, as her firstborn son, that I think she was a success. And for me, she did what she needed to, to, uh, to do what she saw as God's will. And for me, that meant homeschooling. And uh, it also meant all these sisters and her brother. Because of her obedience. And I just want to say to mom what I've said many, many times every night and what I said to her in the hospital a couple of weeks ago when we thought she was going to die there and what I said to her Friday night right after she had died. I said, good night, mom. I'll see you in the morning. My Jesus, as thou wilt. I think this could be said about Carrie.
often meant sitting in a rocking chair and drinking hot coffee while she cradled one of her precious children in the recliner. Often we talked of motherhood. To her, it was God's highest calling in her life. Our conversations encouraged me and helped me believe that changing dirty diapers and holding little ones were worthy and honorable activities. Our coffee would wane as our conversation waxed, and Mark, in his own gracious hospitality, would come with a fresh cup. In the last eight months, as Carrie and I had rocking chair visits, or we, as we talked on the phone, I relayed words of encouragement sent by others. Many times, people told me what an influence she had on their lives. As I mentioned these things, Carrie was so humbled, she never stopped being amazed that God would use her as that broken vessel through which his light could shine. In deep longing to remember that vessel, and in grief that for a time she is hidden from sight, I have pondered what it was that made her such a cherished friend to so many of us. How was it that being with Carrie made us strive to be passionately dedicated to our family, friends, and Lord? As I've pondered this, there are so many wonderful memories on which I've looked back. I have glimpses of Carrie sitting on the floor with a guitar, playing John Denver songs while our babies crawled around and our husbands held their yearly Mocan retreats. There is another of Carrie dressed up like a clown for a costume party. There is Carrie showing me the beautiful bluff at Camp Dakota, or sitting on a swing around the campfire, singing at sunrise services. There's the prayer garden she made. There's a memory with children swimming in the stock tank while Carrie chased the cow from next, next door back over the fence. There are lots of hospital rooms with lots of precious children and Mark and Carrie either being proud parents or proud friends. There's Carrie sitting on the couch, reaching for her Bible to see what God had to say. There are the lives and faces of their eight beautiful children radiating back the light given to them. The verse they broke... The verse, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, will forever remind me of the joyful times God gave us at the Trotters with Carrie. Woven alongside these memories are also bittersweet times when God allowed us to weep with those who weep and to know there is a friend who loves like a brother. But as much as I cherish these photo albums in my mind, events are not the reason I loved Carrie or treasured her friendship. I loved Carrie because she was Carrie. I treasured her friendship because she was a friend who fiercely loved the person of truth, Jesus. All of her relationships were anchored in that love. Like a needle on a compass, her conversations invariably pointed back to his truth. The truth might be hard, but she could not stand the guilt within herself should she not point due north. Carrie was also incredibly perceptive and discerning. Whenever my own compass wavered, I knew she would come alongside me and ask, Is that the truth of Jesus? And I am a better person for it. But Carrie did not encourage a life dedicated toward his truth in anyone more than herself. March 1994 saw her expecting twins. We heard the following prayer written by Betty Scott Stam, a missionary who was martyred in China. Lord, I give up all my plans and purposes, all my own desires and hopes, and accept thy will for my life. I give myself, my life, my all, utterly to thee, to be thine forever. Fill me and seal me with thy Holy Spirit. Use me as thou wilt. Send me as thou wilt. Send me where thou wilt. Work out thy whole will in my life at any cost, now and forever. Carrie took that prayer as her own, and she wrote it in the back of her Bible. In May of 1995, she added the following thoughts. In prayer, I give myself without reservation to God, asking Him to do in, through, and with me anything He wants, at any cost. I trust His power, wisdom, and love as He answers my prayer. I will not be surprised at the answers He chooses. I will be obedient and receive everything with thanksgiving. After she was diagnosed with cancer, she handed me her Bible and asked if I remembered her writing out that prayer. The combination of the prayers she had offered along with the diagnosis weighed heavily on her heart. It became a garden of Gethsemane for her. As she felt her compass begin to waver at the agonizing path ahead, she needed her friends and family to come alongside her and to say, remember the truth of Jesus. She needed us to lovingly give back to her that which she had so faithfully given to us. 
When reminded of what she needed to hear, she clung to the truth. She tried hard to face due north during a raging storm. People throughout the world prayed and fasted for Carrie. God says that we, where he dwells is strength and joy. I knew his spirit dwelt in her, and I asked Jesus to give Carrie his strength, joy, and peace. On her birthday, however, there was no evidence of strength or joy. She was in a coma. But after being asleep for several days, God allowed her to wake. Her hospital room was truly filled with joy. What a gift it was to be able to laugh and cry with her one more time, to be able to hear her spar with her loved ones, to see her take the gingham hat from Catherine's head and put it on her own, to hear Jonathan say to his mother, You go, girl. To see Corey lead the troop of Anna, Sarah, Jamie, and Audrey into the room while Mark helped carry hold Andrew and feed him. Oh, what a gift to see again the mother gather her brood. Earlier that day, she told me she was going to die, that when Jesus came, she was going to go with him. And I could see that she had his peace, his strength, and his joy. She didn't need any pain medication because there was no pain. The agony had gone from her face. I left her hospital room knowing that God, to whom she had surrendered all, had not abandoned my friend. He was and is the person of truth. He did not break her bruised reed or snuff out her smoldering wick. I knew he would lead her on to victory, and he has. To the end, Carrie never stopped being a person of truth. There are many, many wonderful memories, and there are heart-wrenching memories that God alone will make sweet. But then in them all, my dear friend Carrie will always be a vessel shining out God's light. She is within that great cloud of witnesses saying, Remember the truth of Jesus. And it is his truth in Carrie's life that will never die. And so we say, until then, dear friend, goodbye.
God sometimes speaks to us with a shout. More often, it's a whisper. And Carrie listened to those whispers. Be still and know that I am God. Let's stand together this morning as we sing, Be Still My Soul. Be still my soul.
have never experienced. Excuse me. Such a burden. Is this one right now? I wrestled all night long, struggling for something to say this morning. Uh, words that would bring comfort, words that would bring healing, words that would encourage you and encourage me to go on. And I went to bed when I normally get up this morning. And then I just laid there and I never felt so empty. And I kept thinking these thoughts, you're going to get there and you're not going to have anything to share with those people. And I knew where those thoughts were coming from. And yet that voice just seemed to talk to me, especially in the wee hours of the morning. Uh, my heart this morning aches. It sure is does. At the loss of Carrie. And there are, those aches are different for each one of us this morning as we were related to Carrie in different ways. For Mark, his heart aches for his companion and friend of 23 years. For Jonathan, Catherine, Corey, Jamie and Sarah, Audrey and Andrew, their hearts ache for a mother that they loved and enjoyed companionship with. We extended family members, they ache for a daughter or a daughter-in-law, a sister or a sister-in-law. For his dearest friends, they ache for that sweet fellowship that they enjoyed with Carrie. For all of us in some form and fashion, we ache this morning because something very precious has been taken from us. And these aches that we experience this morning are the risk that we take when we extend ourselves to others and we show love. But I encourage you this morning, I encourage myself to keep extending your love to others and to take that risk or you'll just you'll experience an ache of a different kind. The tears that you and I shed today are good and right, and as Carrie would often say, they are cleansing. This morning I know in the, that people are looking at this family and asking that question, why? Why would this come to this family? Why Carrie? The mother of eight precious children who need her. And I, not, I do not come to you this morning with any answers. I could only add to your questions. But I can do, as Carrie was often good to do, is to direct us to God's Word and to remind each one of us of His promises to us. Carrie was always very good to do that for us. She loved God's word and would take us into his word to remind us of those precious promises and commands that he gave us there. A friend came to me last Sunday and suggested that I read a devotional that he found for July 25th in a book called The Streams in the Desert. And quite honestly this morning I couldn't say that I got anything out of the devotional thought. But I was blessed by the verse of scripture given as the springboard for that devotional. 
And that verse was in John chapter 13 and verse 7. And Jesus was speaking there and he said, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. And it was a gift to me from God. In the midst of all the ache, his sweet, gentle voice spoke to me through this verse. You do not realize now what I am doing. And in my conversations with Mark, he would echo this same thought to me. We just don't know all that God is doing, he would say. We don't know the good that will come from this. We don't know the opportunities that will be given to these children in the future because of what is taking place today. And I'm so thankful for a godly friend in Mark, a man who trusts the Lord and a man who knows that God will provide a way. Even in those times, even in these times, when there seems to be no way. The Lord knew I needed lots of reminders about this because he provides it through me, uh, through my best friend Mark. And he also provides it through my wife, Annette. I would joke to Mark about how similar their temperaments were and the thoughts that they would have. And he would hear words from me that would echo what Carrie would say to him. Now, the things that Mark and Carrie taught me, the sovereignty of God stands out the most. They believed and lived under the sovereignty of God. Nothing ever happened as an accident. God was in control, and God is in control. A favorite scripture of Carrie's was Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. And it says that I, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And this was especially helpful during the loss of Laura Beth and her anxiousness with the pregnancy of, of Corey. And this scripture is true, regardless of what appears to be our, our circumstances. And this is where trust must flood our hearts and our minds and just as always seem to be tagged to trust in scripture is the additional command for us to fear not. When all around us appears to be bad, we must trust and fear not. Trusting that God is faithful, faithful to his word, to prosper you and not to harm you, faithful to give you hope and a future. Carrie has experienced a great victory. And as I viewed again last night, uh, the take from a program called Something Beautiful, where Carrie was interviewed after the death of Laura Beth and, and uh, the birth of uh, Corey 11 months later. This time I, I viewed that program through different eyes. And in that interview, she shared a statement that Jonathan made at that time when Laura Beth was in the hospital and Carrie was getting ready to go back to the hospital to be with Laura Beth. And Jonathan was just six years old at the time. And this is what he told Carrie. He said, I'm so sad because when you're with Laura, you're not with us. And when you were with us, you're not with Laura. And today we have a sadness because Carrie is with Laura and she's not with us. But there was another sadness that we experienced when she was with us and not with Laura. I still hear his gentle voice speaking to me. Jim, later you will understand. And I hope this morning that, that you will hear his voice whispering in your ear, Mark, later 
you will understand. Catherine, later, you will understand. Corey, later, you will understand. Heather, later, you will understand. And each one of you, later, you will understand. And then, wait upon the Lord. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and on with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? You ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath will his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abide. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us Goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever, his kingdom is forever. Let us pray to our Lord. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom all every family in heaven and on earth derives his name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length, and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>